Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Pandemic Starts With Me webinar presented by the Minority, Nevada Minority Health and Equity Coalition, UNLV School of Public Health, and Caesars Entertainment. My name is Gwen Megita. I'm the Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion and Social Impact uh, for Caesars Entertainment. I'll be your moderator for today. Today's presenters are an esteemed panel of uh, professionals, uh, physician, or I would say doctors, except for me, uh, Dr. Brian Labus, Dr. Erica Marquez, Dr. Francisco C., and Dr. Christina Madison. Each one of them are esteemed panelists and represent a complementary expertise. So our panel today will speak on the current stages of the pandemic, myths and concerns to overcome. Uh, well noted that we've had over a year of the pandemic and many conversations have occurred, but there is still more to learn and uh, more to consider and discuss as we uh, are shifting to a, a new phase or a different phase of the pandemic, really working to achieve higher vaccination rates among minorities. This is the first such uh, discussion externally that several of the sponsors have uh, collaborated on in the gaming industry as well. So as your moderator, I'll be sharing a bit more background on each as I go into specific questions. We'll have some time for Q&A in the end, we hope. So please submit them in the Q&A function or the chat, and we'll be monitoring that as well. So the first question goes to Dr. Labus, um, who comes to us with a, a very interesting background on outbreak investigations, disease surveillance, and implementing public health uh, informat informatic systems. So Dr. Labus, as we just diving deep in, deeper into this pandemic and the current phase, what, what's currently going on in Nevada and locally in Southern Nevada? Could you share us a bit of the updates and directives from the governor as well? Sure. Um, well, if you look at the Nevada data, it's really skewed by Southern Nevada. So everything we look at when we talk about statewide, unfortunately, it shows us really what's happening here. But um, for the past two or three months, we've seen this continual increase in cases of COVID. Uh, starting around the beginning of July, we've seen this this big increase. I guess early June, we've seen this increase going on week over week. We're finally at a point where it looks like it's plateaued, maybe starting to to decrease. But uh, we have a lot of disease transmission going on. We're still at high levels for it, and most of that transmission is happening uh, because of the Delta variant. That has been the thing that's changed all the numbers nationwide. And unfortunately, in Nevada, we were kind of leading the charge with uh, the Delta variant. So things hit us here, especially in Southern Nevada sooner uh, than they did in the rest of the country. And uh, we've seen that that gradual increase. Hopefully we're turning the corner now where things are starting to decline, which would be similar to the pattern we saw last year, just delayed by three or four weeks or so. Uh, in Northern Nevada, they're seeing the same sort of thing. It just wasn't, uh, didn't hit them as early and didn't hit them as hard early on as it did for us. Uh, they're seeing more of that transmission now. They're a bit behind us, but uh, if you look statewide, those numbers just get washed out by the total number of people from Southern Nevada. Um, but the, the Delta variant has really hit us hard and that's driven everything that we've seen. The majority of the cases are still in unvaccinated people. And if we look at hospitalizations and deaths, uh, the, that's what's basically uh, happening in unvaccinated people. We're not seeing uh, that many hospitalizations or deaths in our vaccinated population. Uh, it's really the unvaccinated people that still continue to drive this pandemic. And also with school starting, um, what, what, what is the vaccination uh, timeline for children under 12? Well, for children under 12, that's the one group we're still uh, waiting to get the FDA approval. When they uh, went to the FDA for their approval, the FDA said they wanted six months of follow-up data, not the two months. The two months of data is what they used for the emergency use authorization. Uh, so by re requesting more data, it just takes longer to collect that data, which means it's going to take some time before they can get the approval for children under 12. Those clinical trials are going on right now. They're still collecting data on, uh, on all those kids. We're just not at the point where we have the results of those trials and can move to the approval process. So it's still going to be a little while before we can uh, see a vaccine for kids, uh, likely sometime in the new year. I don't think they'll they'll get through that six month, have it analyzed, uh, submitted, and approved before the end of the year. But uh, by early next year is when we should be talking about that in children. Okay. Uh, my kids, my daughter's going to kindergarten, so I'll be prepared for that as well <laughs> in about a week. Um, so the next series of questions go to Dr. Madison and Dr. C. With Dr. Madison's background on um, really looking at uh, infectious communicable, communicable diseases as well, and Dr. C, um, just with a background on CDC and National Institutes of Health. Just um, from your perspective, how is COVID-19 affecting ethnic minority groups? For example, why are they the most vulnerable? How can we address vaccine hesitantly, 
hesitancy among these groups as well. Yeah, so I'll go ahead and, um, and start uh, off the conversation. I think the biggest thing um, that I've seen is access to care and then ultimately um, we're seeing issues around the digital divide. So um, initially when we first started scheduling appointments, everything was done online. And so I think that unfortunately, um, as well as some of the skepticism within uh, you know, our BIPOC community and in particular our black community um, about whether or not this vaccine was something that they thought was gonna be good for them. Um, you know, I think that that really caused some uh, consternations right at the beginning when we first started uh, rolling out the vaccine last December and, and early January when we were targeting the elderly and them, you know, compromised and people who were at high risk. And so even when we had people who were eligible, they may not have known where to go to get access to the appointment, right? So I really do think that it comes down to access and then um, being able to educate and getting those campaigns out to those communities of color. And so um, for me personally, um, I was very open and honest about my vaccine journey because again, I wanted to be an example as a woman of color and then um, you know, being boots on the ground, going in and, and doing vaccine clinics at places like Historic West Side and you know places like Nevada Partners, where it was just, you know majority African American population. But even when we were doing that, we were still seeing um, not as many people from the from the actual community and the zip codes that we were at actually coming to the clinics. And so now, um, again, I think those people who are sort of in that movable middle um, still need their questions answered. And we really just have to take this one-on-one -on -one approach to making sure that people understand why it's so important because they're at such high risk, um, because we've just seen the health disparities and equities just being exacerbated so much by this pandemic. Great, thank think, you for that. Uh, yeah, for a, a lot of minority population, there's lack of trust. Uh, there's a lot of uh, miscommunication, mixed signals being sent by the government and different groups so that uh, some people that really are misinformed or they look at social media. And, and if you look at certain social media, they always give you a lot of uh, wrong information and they believe whatever is in print or in what they see in the internet. So I think, um, I think basically we need to really be more transparent about things so that people will understand and get the message that it's very important that they protect themselves and their family and they can protect other people too. So that at this point in time, we want to make sure uh, we play a role. There's an effective vaccine available. So uh, use it and protect yourself and your family. And Dr. Marquez, uh, you've done a lot of work on health equity and access. I'm curious to know from your perspective, what, what is the balance between access and education or influence, I guess? So there's a, a big uh, uh, multitude of, of um, it, what, what would it take to get other minorities over the, the hump to get the, uh, the vaccine? Yeah, so no, we've been doing a ton of work since the beginning of the pandec pandemic, really providing education on on COVID risk and now on the vaccine. And, you know, I think one of our, our really hardest challenges right now at this point in the pandemic is the amount of disinformation and misinformation because it's almost hard for us to keep up with that. And so I think that, you know, that's one of our biggest challenges in thinking about equity because um, our communities are so confused and, and with, you know, you can go on to like Dr. C mentioned, you can go onto any social media platform and there's folks sharing so much information and sometimes they're medical providers too, right? And the, that has added a whole layer of challenges for us in response to this pandemic. So, you know, thinking about like, how do we, who do we trust? And so there's, there's, there, there's so much legitimacy in terms of like why people are still at a point where they're hesitant about taking the vaccine. And so one of the things that we have been trying to educate our community on is really about um, knowing where that source of information is coming from. Are there like intentions by this? Someone trying to sell you some vitamins that they think this is going to be our cure to the vaccine, I mean, to COVID. Um, are, are there other things? Are they directing you to non-scientific websites or information? Or even sometimes it looks like they're interpreting data that is inaccurate. 
Um, and so this has been really like at this point in the game, it's really been our challenge in really trying to keep up with the amount of misinformation that is being shared amongst our community members. And we have really been focused on the groundwork with community partners, our trusted leaders in the community to really get a, a grip of like what's happening, what are those conversations and helping them um, get that information, that accurate information out into the community. Thank you. So back to Dr. Labus and Dr. Madison, um, just speaking about what, what Dr. Marquez was alluding to, what, what are some of the top, let's just say, top five myths you're hearing and uh, how do you, would you address them one-on-one? -on -one? Like what, what are the answers to the myths in, in general so we can look out for them? Do you want to start on this one, Dr. Labus? Or? I'll let you start. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> so top five uh, the vaccine's going to change your DNA. So that's number one, right? So let me dispel that one first and foremost. So uh, the messenger RNA vaccines that we have, so both Pfizer and Moderna, um, I like to tell people that the mRNA vaccines are like the Snapchat of vaccination. So it shows your immune cells a picture and then it kind of disappears. It doesn't enter the nucleus, which is where your DNA is. It can't change your DNA. Um, it's, it's RNA, so it can't do anything to your DNA. Um, so that's number one. Um, the second myth um, is that there is a microchip in the vaccine. That is also a myth and is not accurate. Um, considering the amount of fluid um, that uh, we are currently injecting in you and the uh, needle that we are using, it is impossible for us to get a microchip in there. So that is also um, incorrect. Uh, number three is that um, it can impact your future fertility. There has been no evidence. Um, and on to the contrary, it's actually being recommended in pregnant and breastfeeding women. Uh, number four um, is that uh, if you are, um, if you have severe allergies, you can't get this vaccine, um, which is also not true. Um, so at the very beginning of the pandemic, we did see people having allergic reactions to the vaccine. Um, but obviously within an abundance of caution, we told people who had history of severe allergies to like food or medication to just make sure that they had their EpiPens with them and just to understand that that's a possibility. But that didn't really bore out any, um, you know, anything that was uh, demonstrably different from just the general population and allergies and allergic reactions. And I think the fifth and the last one um, that I would say is that um, that the vaccine um, somehow is going to make you magnetic, um, which is also not true. <laughs> um, so um, it does not change your body chemistry. It does not change your DNA. It does not uh, suddenly make you magnetic. Um, I, I wish it would um, make me, uh, you know, have a magnetic, more magnetic personality. <laughs> Maybe more people would get it. Um, but that is, those are the top five that I can tell you. Um, and hopefully I dispelled some of those myths, but those are the big ones that I've heard. And I would add, there's a broad category of misunderstanding that's, it's separate from individual myths, but it's the idea that the vaccine is unsafe and untested. Um, and that could not be more wrong. Uh, all the parts that are in the vaccine have been used for years and tested. Uh, the idea that this vaccine was put together too quickly, well, it was only because we spent decades getting to the point where we could put it together quickly. It's kind of like saying, you know, I called the fire department and they got here too quickly. Well, yeah, they didn't have to build the trucks and hire people. It was all ready to go when there was an emergency. And that's what we did with this vaccine. It is shown to be safe and effective. We've tested it thoroughly. Uh, and people looked at that, uh, the FDA emergency use approval and said, well, it wasn't tested. Yes, it was. It was just a different way of approving things because there was a public health emergency. So I think all those questions about safety are, are valid concerns to have. Uh, unfortunately, uh, they, it, it scared people off from getting the vaccine and none of those things are true. It is a very safe and effective vaccine. Incredible with the age of information, there's also the, the DIS uh, in front of the information as well, because it's uh, very confusing. Speaking about confusion, some of the feedback has also been uh, over the booster shot to the need for a third dose to have this work. What is your reaction to that for, for any of you on the panel? Uh, regarding the booster shots? Right, I, about I did, what the need is. Yeah, are. because uh, based on studies they've done, they've seen that um, after the second dose, I think 
uh, your immunity would uh, wane, there will be a waning immunity toward um, uh, a few months later. So if you do the booster eight months after your second dose, you know, you'd increase your uh, immunity to it. So that's why uh, they're recommending a, a booster shot later on when and when it's rolled out, uh, I think later part of September, and then they start again with the elderly and the and the frontliners before they reach to the general population. Right now, it's only for the immunocompromised who are transplant patients, the uh, those with acutely ill with HIV or those uh, being treated with chemotherapy. So those are people that need it right now because they're immunosuppressed. Go ahead, Chrissy. No, I was just going to add um, sort of this concept because I think, uh, you know, explaining the difference between the booster versus the third dose. So um, when Dr. C mentioned the immunocompromised population, we want people to understand that we want you to go and get that third dose now because you most likely did not get an adequate response from the first two doses. So really we were, we're, we're encouraging you to do that now because we want you to have better protection because you probably didn't get the same level of protection as someone else who wasn't immunosuppressed. So that was the big thing I wanted to stress. And then the booster dose, um, which is hopefully going to be rolled out around the week of September 20th, that not to rush out and try to go get that now, that you really should wait based on when you got that second dose. And then ultimately, Johnson & Johnson actually just released a statement today it was just a press release, it wasn't data, but that the booster dose for the Johnson & Johnson dose is actually probably coming soon as well. So remember, the messenger RNA vaccines were initiated in December of 2020 versus the Johnson & Johnson, we didn't start using that until March. And so that eight months is probably gonna be a little bit further off. And so I think a lot of people were anxious if they got Johnson & Johnson because they didn't know what to do. They're like, hey, what about us? But it looks like the data is supporting giving a second dose and that that second dose actually boosts those um, virus neutralizing antibodies probably about nine times more than what they got from the first one. So it's really good news. Um, I think for people that, you know, it's coming um, and we really just want to increase that durability of the vaccine, not just the safety and the efficacy side, but that it lasts as long as possible so that we can really weather the storm with this Delta variant. Yeah, I, I think this is this is exactly what we expect to see with a new vaccine. Uh, we try it in a population and we see what happens over time. We can't tell you what's going to happen with your antibody levels five years from now because nobody's been uh, vaccinated for five years. And if you look back at all the vaccines we give to kids, we started by having a one or two dose series and a lot of times added booster doses to that. Uh, we had measles was a single shot vaccine and then we saw breakthrough cases with that added a, another dose of the measles vaccine. We did the same thing with chickenpox. And so we start out with our basic understanding of these and often we learn that we need to boost the immune system. And so this is exactly what's expected. It doesn't mean it failed. It doesn't mean it didn't work. This is how we learn about things and this is how we move forward with using those vaccines as best we can. And what is some of the hesitancy is also about um, waiting for vac uh, the vaccine to be FDA approved um, from what I'm hearing. What, what exactly does that mean for, for the vaccine to be FDA approved for any of you? What, what difference does that make in, uh, in the, 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 uh, the actual workings of the, the vaccine um, relative to the myth or hesitancy? I guess I'll go first then. Um, so, um, there's no difference in the vaccine. The vaccine is the exact same one before FDA approval as it was after FDA approval. It comes down to the basic uh, difference in the way we approve vaccines. So when there's an emergency situation, um, there is a pressing need for that. So we want to use that vaccine sooner. It doesn't mean we skip steps. It doesn't mean we don't show that it's safe or anything like that. Uh, but we go through an emergency use process, which doesn't require as long of a follow-up typically, so we can get it to market sooner. Well, we've done that and we've vaccinated close to 4 billion people worldwide with our different vaccines. So we've been following these for some time. We have a ton of data now uh, that shows everything we, we saw from that initial emergency use was correct. It's safe. It's effective. Uh, it's something that, that should be used with our population. So they went back and had the, the full approval from the FDA. They just looked at longer term data that showed the exact same thing. Uh, so in terms of uh, what the vaccine does, it doesn't make a difference in terms of the way it's administered or what's included. That's all the same. The only difference is 
uh, sometimes the legal issues around the vaccine. And we had some discussions about, uh, could you mandate people to get a vaccine that has emergency use approval or not? Um, now that whole issue has just gone away. And so basically it's a, uh, it's a longer term follow-up for the FDA uh, to look at those vaccines, but it also doesn't mean that we're done. Uh, once we approve a vaccine, there's an entire process of following it as long as we use it to look for side effects, look for problems, see if something goes wrong with it down the road that we, you know, if it happens one in a billion times, we're not going to see it if we only test it in 100,000 people or something like that. So it's really the, uh, the time when we bring it to market, the company can now give it a brand name and some things like that. So you might hear it called something different. It doesn't change anything though. It's still the same vaccine it was before, just as safe, just as effective and recommended just like it has been for the past year. I also just wanted to make one other clarification. Um, so as of right now, there's only one uh, vaccine that has received this FDA approval. So that's the Pfizer vaccine. And specifically, it was for what the initial emergency res- um, use authorization was applied for. So um, the 16 and up category. And the reason why I make this clarification is because I don't want parents to think that, oh, no, it's only FDA approved for 16 and up, which means I cannot get my kids vaccinated, which is absolutely not true. We still have an emergency use authorization in place for the 12 to 15 year old age group. And hopefully, sometime before the end of this year, we'll also get it for the younger age group and the under 12 age group as well. And so I just wanted to make that clarification because of our vaccinated, we know that the smallest portion of those who are eligible to be vaccinated are our adolescents and our young adults. So we really want to make sure people understand that even though this FDA approval was specific to the 16 and up, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be getting your adolescents vaccinated. Thank you for that. So how did, so we have probably more casino resort hospitality um, audience on this uh, on this uh, webinar. How how can casinos and resorts work with entities like yourselves and the uh, the School of Public Health as well as a, as a coalition, the Minority Health and Equity Coalition, really to focus on improving the health of the the community? How, how important are partnerships like this? Maybe to Dr. Marquez. Yeah, absolutely. Um, If anything we learned throughout this pandemic is that this is work we can't do alone. And our business leaders are such a key component of this process. So this really is a stepping stone for us to be able to solidify a collaboration to continue to help inform, um, you know, your, your group, your audience. Um, And it's so important because, you know, we have to keep our finger on the pulse on what's the concerns in our community. Um, And we have to be responsive. I think throughout this entire pandemic, we have continuously tried to pivot to make sure that we're addressing the concerns that we're hearing on the ground, that we're addressing the misinformation or just really just sometimes just questions and concerns. You know, if I have a comorbidity, um, should I be taking the vaccine? Like, absolutely, yes. And we've had we've deployed. Um, you know, pharmacists, physicians to be at vaccination sites that they're answering the questions. Because even even if people show up at our vaccination sites, we know that they still have questions. So we've been trying to ease those concerns as as those um, immunization sites go up in the communities. Um, But really, again, um, bring that uh, a forum to be able to address the questions and concerns as they arise. It has been really key for us to be able to continue to adequately respond to this pandemic. So are there specific projects or actions that, uh, let's say, I'm I'm speaking to, uh, we have a corporate responsibility coalition with Nevada Resorts. They're one of the the sponsors as well. What, What should I be asking my counterparts to do to, to support uh, your efforts. Absolutely. As you know, we're very operational. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Um, we co lead the Nevada Vaccine Equity Collaborative with Immunize Nevada, really a call to action from our governor. Um, and having our business leaders part of that conversation, it's again, it's it's really about opening that line of communication for us to know what are the needs for you as a business, for your for your employees, and how do we address that? And I think that has what has been key in helping us pivot constantly throughout this pandemic. What information do we need to live, deliver? Who are the people we need to tap on the shoulder? Such as this amazing panel of speakers who we often pull together 
pretty often <laughs> um, to help us address those questions and really give um, our community the fact-based answers to try to move us along into getting us vaccinated. So, so we don't have to deal with so many variants and we don't have to deal with the consequences of you know, things changing so often. I want to say something about that because a lot of the big companies are looking for a magic bullet. And, and I'll tell you, there's no single magic bullet. It's a combination of factors. So aside from vaccine, you should also continue wear mask and continue your social distancing. So all these different factors should be a combination of mitigation measures that work, but no single measure is effective by itself. Even though we have effective vaccine available, still uh, in Southern Nevada, we only have a vaccination, full vaccination rate of 48.7%. In other words, the other half of our population are not vaccinated, so they can continue to be uh, uh, exposing other people if they're infected. And also worldwide, you can see that we may have higher rate of vaccination with other countries. The poorer countries have no access to vaccine. So uh, although effective vaccine available, they don't have, they can access because they're so poor that they don't, don't have those uh, vaccines available to them. So, and so I think as long as there's an equal uh, access to different vaccines, so it will continue to be a big pandemic because uh, you need to reach at least 70 percent of population fully vaccinated in order to reach the herd immunity and, and be protected, uh, protective of the whole population. I just wanted to add, um, you know, one more point here. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm hearing. Um, especially in, you know, populations that maybe don't have access to things like childcare, or if they're concerned that if they have a side effect after getting the vaccine that they can't take a day off because of finances or because they don't feel like they could take a day off from their employer. Um, I do think that the business community can really um, get out front of that and talk with their employees if that is one of their um, you know, hesitations about getting the vaccine. Um, I know that the Biden administration specifically has put money aside and tax credits for businesses that want to allow their employees to take a sick day that can be paid um, as well as if they need to get um, childcare. And so I think that's something that we could do um, just as a whole to try to help people feel more comfortable um, because finances are such a concern right now. Um, you know, people, are, our economy is bustling, right? We've seen all these tourists coming in town, but there are still people that um, either have partial work and want to work full time, or maybe the position that they had before paid them more money. And so we do need to take those financial things into consideration. I know that the state was considering doing a $100 voucher. We had the Vax Nevada days. There's all these things that people can get, but I think it's that that having that um, consistency and having um, the reliability of those resources that really will help people feel more comfortable making that decision. And then one more thing I just wanted to say is I just wanted to applaud Caesars Entertainment for having this forum and for giving myself and, and our panelists here the space and the platform to really talk about things in a manner that is you know, easily uh, digestible and, you know, is from um, people that are part of the BICOC community and um, really putting a friendly face on things and, and really um, being committed to public health and being on the forefront of what we need to do as a city um, because tourism and entertainment is what we're built on and, and we need to all do this together. Thank you for that, Dr. Madison. Appreciate it. Other thoughts on how we can get more in the, the gaming hospitality industry? I, I, for example, I've heard of other cities who might, um, the city itself may have uh, funded, you know, a, a, a pretty sizable amount of money to, going directly to service providers to answer phone calls, very grassroots oriented and, and really arming those service providers that the BIPOC community knows and trusts. Um, and so it's very much of a, a grassroots effort. Is that Anything that we're looking at in Southern Nevada or, or an effort that we might uh, uh, engage or recommend uh, to expand more of the, the grassroots uh, efforts as well? 
You know, we've taken on, um, you know, we're always open to different approaches. And one thing that we have implemented recently or are starting to gradually get that on the ground is canvassing efforts. But absolutely, we're open to re-strategizing how we communicate because we are at a kind of a point in the pandemic where we need to have more one-on-one -on -one conversations with our community members about the hesitancy that they're experiencing about taking the vaccine. And so we've used our community partners um, to canvas efforts, to canvas and do one, and really have that one-on-one -on -one conversation to address those questions. And any opportunity in which someone can talk to a trusted medical provider, I think is incredibly welcome, even for those that don't have a primary, I mean, especially for those that don't have a primary care provider. And that has been something that we've been trying to fill that gap. And that that is really an essential point of like, just getting information that you feel is trusted. So this is something that got brought up on a recent phone call um, that I was part of with Immunize Nevada. So we, we are looking at um, recruiting uh, volunteer providers to um, help with fielding some of those phone calls because we already have an existing hotline for vaccines. Um, so that is something that is being discussed right now um, to be able to utilize that a little bit more um, robustly because right now we're not the, the people who are answering those calls are non-medical. And so we are looking at maybe having like, you know, uh, office hours, but specifically for questions to medical providers um, at, at the state level. Thank you for that. And we're, I'm gonna encourage other questions to be submitted. There's about four of them that I'm gonna take momentarily. I mean, I and as you all are sharing, it makes me think of conversations now with community members, or you know or others today versus say months ago where i feel like it's in a, a closeted state right now where people may or may not admit whether or not they're vaccinated or may not it's, it's, it's this other layer of a barrier i think that's happening so some of us um, earlier might have mentioned um, some questions coming in on what would it take or what should i say to a family member or friend i know dr c said there's no magic bullet but if you had you know, two things that um, might be most influential for a family member or friend who may either be closeted, non-vaccinated, or very scared, um, what would you say to them? And maybe it's not about the, the science, right? Maybe it's about the heart tug emotion. I know this is a very different kind of conversation, but for some of it, it's, it's like political campaigns, right, or issues, ballots. You, you get around the emotion, they'll tug. You don't get around the, the brain, it's the heart. All right, the heart over the mind. Any any thoughts about that on, on some of the, the questions that were submitted earlier? What would you say to a, a friend or family uh, to, to be most influential if it, if it wasn't around the science, if it was another argument? I know we're, we're pulling a different side of our brain. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Honestly, I think it's unfortunately it's it's the sad stories, right? It's the stories about the, you know, the pregnant mom who is in the hospital holding the hand of their spouse that's now ventilated with COVID, not knowing whether or not they're going to pull through to see their child. It's, you know, my husband who used to work um, in the gaming industry finding out on the five o'clock news that one of his coworkers that he used to work with passed away from COVID and left five children behind. You know, it's those kinds of things um, that unfortunately I think is what's making the biggest impact. And then especially during um, the surge that we're seeing right now with Delta, I feel like fear has been the biggest motivator and that people are going because they fear being hospitalized, they fear you know, the what if, like, what if I get sick with this? And not even just what if I get sick, but what happens if I end up with long haul COVID and the complications following the infection? And so as much as we want to spin it the positive and be like, oh, you know, we should get vaccinated for your family and your friends, right? It, it, it is sometimes talking about the, you know, the sad stories that we don't want people to end up like, because you know, honestly, right now, all of the deaths that are happening are almost 100% completely preventable. We have the tools to prevent these people from dying. They're just not using them. And unfortunately, it's because of the misinformation. It's because of social media. It's because of, you know, people thinking that somehow that we're trying to brainwash them or microchip them or whatever else, you know, reasons they think about. But 
honestly, I just, I just want people to understand that it's not just about you and your individual self. It's, it's about the health and wellness of our community. And until we can get that into people's minds and actually get them to have empathy for their neighbor and their friend, or not even their friend, not somebody that they know, but somebody that could also be impacted, it's going to be so hard for us to get past the, you know, the 48% fully vaccinated that Dr. You know, C mentioned earlier. Um, you know, it's, it, we, we've hit, a, unfortunately, we've hit a, a block and I don't know what else is going to help other than fear and people not wanting to get hospitalized. And I don't know if um, I have any magic words to that, you know, and I think that when I think about why I got vaccinated, right, this comes down to, I feel a responsibility for my community. And I, I feel like in public health, we are our brother's keepers, right? And, and that is what has driven, uh, I'm sure everyone on this panel to work 70 hours a week, probably more so every week since the start of this pandemic, to try to sell, to not sell that message, really to, to express that commitment, not only to ourselves, to our families, but to our community. Um, and, I, and I don't know how else to phrase that, but really about this sense of responsibility for everyone in our community, regardless of your social class, regardless of your race, ethnicity, that we have a responsibility to each other. And, and I think to me that that's the most I can share. If, if I can't convince you on the science, um, I want to convince you on the humanity of it, that we want to, we have to pull out of this. And the only way to do that is together. I, I think, see uh, Fuede, yes, we can. I think we have done it before with SARS. You can see that in 2003, we were able to prevent and control the spread of SARS. And so I think, and the other pandemic that we don't talk about is the HIV pandemic. I mean, I, I was, I came to this country as a student and that's when I started seeing it in 1981, I can see at that time, day after day, somebody would be dying of AIDS. Now you don't hear that anymore because we've developed very effective antiretroviral therapy to treat them. Although they still have HIV, but it's just very undetectable level, which is not transmissible anymore. And they're able to go back and work. It's a manageable disease, although there's no vaccine for it. There's a treatment to suppress the virus. So the same thing is gonna happen with, with the COVID-19. If we all, uh, get vaccinated, wear a mask, social distance, we will, able to, we will be able to stop this pandemic. So as this uh, panel uh, uh, says earlier, you know, uh, we can stop it if we all work together as a group, each one teach one, each one reach one. I'm thinking about the most salient times. I'm, I'm older than I, my hair color looks. Uh, my, I remember driver's ed classes um, the fear tactic of the gruesome scenes of the cars and the teenagers who were in accidents. I mean, literally, it was very morbid. That was part of our education. And yes, it was many years ago, but the, the fear on the empathy and getting to the heart and not the, you know, the brain on wearing seatbelts, for example, was uh, a turning, was one of my, my most vivid memories on a, a way to teach, but, but educate and influence differently. Not to say that we should be extremely morbid, but uh, that was uh, the empathy piece of it as well. Um, I'm going to go through can my I, questions. Can I add public... something on this before we go on? Since, since I come at this from a very different angle. I mean, mine is just pure science. People are not asking me for emotional arguments or anything like that. They want to know facts and data. But I think it's not what I'm saying to them. It's the fact that I'm listening to them. Um, and that, to me, makes the biggest difference. I'm not dismissing the things that they say, even if it seems way out there to me. For them, it's a valid concern. And I address those things factually, but it's the fact that they feel comfortable asking me the question, even if they might be embarrassed about it, do it in public or something like that. But I'm going to listen to that and give them an honest answer. Um, I'm not trying to convince them emotionally, but I am being very honest with them. And I'm not, uh, I'm not trying to make it seem better than it is. You know, is the vaccine perfect? No, it's not. And I explain that it largely works, but it's not perfect and why and all those sort of things. So, so I, I think that winds up being the important part is just listening to why people have those concerns. And uh, before we get into some of the trying to convince them, at least uh, that's the way I found it to be most effective in getting people to change their mind. 
Thank you for that. You know, some of you mentioned, alluded to a few times earlier that the Delta variant is highly transmittable. This is a question from our audience. Um, the request, the a, attendee is saying, I'm not sure exactly what, what, looks, what it looks like in real time. For example, if you're talking with an infected, to an infected person face to face, and neither of you is wearing an N95 mask, can you catch it? If an infected person is walking in front of you, sneezes or coughs, and you follow closely behind that person, can you also catch that? As an example is, does the virus live longer on surfaces than in the air? What, what exactly does this mean for the Delta variant? I can take this Anyone one. Um, so, so the Delta variant, um, the biggest difference we see between the Delta variant and the previous ones is that if you get infected, your viral load is much higher. So you're producing a lot more virus in your body, which means if you're around other people, there's more virus for you to spread. So as a result, it spreads more easily in a population. That is the simple difference. It doesn't cause a different disease, doesn't live longer in surfaces. It's no different in the air. The way we spread it is no different. Just think of it as you sneezing 10 times instead of once. There's just a lot more stuff out there to spread to somebody else. Um, and as I say, sneeze, Christina did. So uh, <laughs> um, with, with this variant, it's the same mode of transmission as before. If you're face-to-face -face with somebody, there is a risk that you could transmit the virus, but it's not a guarantee. If you're walking behind somebody, the more distance between you and them, the more the virus is gonna fall out of the air that you're not gonna be exposed to. But you happen to walk by a fan and it blows it up and it keeps it in the air a little bit longer, there's gonna be some increased risk there. So, so it's no different than the previous uh, virus that the actions we take should be uh, exactly the same. But now we also have the vaccine that helps protect us when all those things are not enough. Thank you. Other thoughts? Anyone else? No, I was just gonna um, just add on the, the aerosolized nature, right? So like at the very beginning of the pandemic, we were not as sure about the risk from surfaces. And so even though it's, it's much lower, I do want to encourage people to continue to use hand sanitizer and to wash their hands, right? So it's multiple layers of, of public health interventions that we're doing like mask wearing, vaccinating, social distancing, and hand washing, which is extremely effective, right? Um, and so I did want to just maybe briefly touch on ventilation. So that is something that um, we know is impactful. Um, and so, you know, initially there was a study that was done at a restaurant um, where you saw, you know, sort of multiple tables within that restaurant from one person that was, in, you know, that was infected because the ventilation system was actually spreading the respiratory droplets throughout the restaurant. And so the time, the amount of time you spend somewhere without your mask on is also part of this as well. So when we think about your level of risk tolerance, you need to think about what things potentially and what places may be a higher risk for you to end up with the transmission of the virus. So the more people they are without an unknown vaccine status that are not wearing masks, that are closely together, and we don't know what the ventilation system is, the increase of the risk for you to potentially become infected. And then obviously we now know with Delta that you can still be vaccinated and still get the virus. And so it's less likely, but we are seeing some of those breakthrough cases, which is also part of the new data that we saw coming out of Israel and the UK for a more, uh, you know, more of a, of a case to doing the booster doses coming in September. So, yeah, it's going on the booster dose. There's another question: Is the booster different than the first vaccine, or is it the same shot, just boosting the original? And the third booster should be done, or is this? Should this also be done roughly 30 days after the second dose? So I guess a few questions in one about um, how different this is, the, the booster is from the first vaccine. Anyone want to take that? So it's the same dose at this point. Um, we have not changed it. Um, all three of the vaccine formulations that we have are still quite robust against Delta at this point, but the more we have unvaccinated um, individuals and a vector for the, the virus to change, that could 
you know, that could be a different story, right? And so just wanted to, to mention that. And as far as the timing, um, so when we say booster, that's really for somebody who got an adequate immune response from the first series of the vaccine, whether that was two of the messenger RNA or one of the, of the viral vector vaccine, which is the Janssen vaccine. And so at this point, the recommendation is eight months after you received that second dose of the messenger RNA or um, we're still waiting on information for the Janssen vaccine, um, but it's looking like more likely six months for that one. Um, but again, the data, it hasn't been fully published for that one. We just got a press release today. Um, and so eight months after the second dose of the messenger RNA for your booster, and then potentially six months after you got the, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And so that's kind of where we're at right now for the booster. I do know there are people that have either gone across state lines or gone somewhere else or told them, oh, I wasn't vaccinated. Um, we are really encouraging people not to do that. Um, and if you are going to get your booster, that that booster dose should be from that eight month window and that you should get the same vaccine that you started with. So if you started with Pfizer, you need to get a booster with Pfizer. If you started with Moderna, you need to get a booster with Moderna. And um, having the FDA approval should not not be uh, something that you're concerned about. Moderna likely will be come, coming soon um, because remember when we looked at when these were authorized, they were authorized about a week apart from each other. So Moderna is likely going to be following suit as getting a full FDA approval hopefully soon. Thank you. And this message is for Dr. C. Um, should, vac should vaccines be providing full immunity from COVID? Why are some of those who are vaccinated are still getting it? Uh, those are what you call the breakthrough infection. And you know that our um, vaccines for Pfizer and Moderna, they're both 95% effective. Uh, so you still have those 5% that uh, may not uh, be protected. And But even though you're, you're infected, if you're vaccinated, you usually get very mild infection. So unlike those who are unvaccinated, if they're infected, they get very severe disease that would result in hospitalization, and probably death. So that's how, what's happening now. So I think um, it's still very important to get vaccinated because if you get infected, you still get a mild infection, not the severe one. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna ask a, uh, a question, generally speaking, um, you know, what is your position on employers mandating vaccines? Um, and, uh, you know, how, I know you're, health professionals, um, but any, any words of advice for people asking in the audience um, whether or not to, you know, you would recommend employers do this or not? Maybe a health equity person like Dr. Marquez can answer this, <laughs> if, if not. No, sure. Um, you know, I think we support efforts to help us improve our vaccination rates. And from a health equity standpoint, we know our essential service workers are predominantly represented by ethnic minority populations, right? And if we look at case rate data, hospitalizations, death rates, you know, amongst our Native, Hispanic, African American, we are overrepresented in those in that data. Um, and we attend to be, high, again, highly representative in those essential service workers, which increases our risk of exposure. So for us, I think, you know, it, it is, it's helpful for us and we support those, those efforts to increase the vaccination rates amongst our population. It, it really does help move that needle forward where we're kind of at, at that sticking point. Are you saying that employers should mandate that or not, not to put you on the spot but that's the question <laughs> you know i what, what is no it's a great question and you know i think to be very fair and honest about it i i think they should right we do have a responsibility to protect those around us this is not about a decision about um me and about all of us um and we have to do our best to protect the safety of all of those around us okay so I'm going to take the perspective of a healthcare professional who's also an academician. So all of my students that go out on rotations and they're in a clinical setting and are engaging in patient care are all required to be up to date on their vaccinations. So I don't feel that this is any different. 
especially when we're thinking about this as what it is. It's an infectious communicable disease that is spread easily in the air. You don't even have to try to get it. You literally just have to breathe. So for me, I think that this, this is not unusual. This is not uncustomary. Um, I think that if you are in the public and you are working with large groups of people that you should um, protect yourself and you should protect your patrons. And I think it's not just good public health policy. I think it's good business because also you don't want your employees to have to, you know, take time off because they're sick or ill. Or if you have some of your employees vaccinated and some that aren't, then you end up having one employee test positive And then anybody who worked with them has to quarantine. So again, th this isn't just good public health policy. This is good business because you can actually plan better for your future of your business. And so, um, you know, that's, that's my personal take on it. Obviously there, there could be some debate about that, but I think that this is, this is something that has been done in many other things, right? Childcare, going to school, our children all before this all had to have their routine recommended vaccinations. Right. And every time a new vaccine came out and was recommended by ACIP, which is the authority, we added it to to that list right and then now kids go and they get their back to school shots and then they go back to school right this is what has prevented us from spreading illnesses for decades it is one of the single most successful public health stories and interventions that we have in modern medicine is the use of vaccinations i, I agree with the two other panelists that we should mandate um, uh, mandatory uh, vaccination of our employees in the workplace, not only to protect ourselves, but also to protect our colleagues and also customers, especially uh, Las Vegas is a, uh, uh, we depend so much on tourism. If we can assure our tourists that our employees are all vaccinated, then they won't have any problem coming here because they, they feel safe, you know, and, but they have to also be sure that they also get vaccinated so that they don't mix with the other people and then spread it. So. I think it. Uh, I think I agree with the other panels that we should really uh, require mandatory vaccination. Thank you, Dr. C. Any other thoughts, Dr. Labus? I don't think you're going to find a public health person who says they don't want to see everybody vaccinated. Um, that is our goal. We want the population protected because disease spreads among a group, not among individuals. It, if the disease works its way into the population, we're all affected directly, indirectly. We are a link in that chain. And so anything that we can do, including mandatory vaccinations at workplaces or just like we did on college campuses, that drives us to a greater percentage of people being vaccinated as well. Thank you. Speaking about um, uh, the viruses and changing and spreading, there's another question from the audience. Given how quickly the virus can mutate, how concerned are you about Lambda? Um, I guess I'll start on this one. I'm not particularly concerned about Lambda um, because essentially the virus has to outcompete another virus and Delta spreads really easy right now. Uh, Lambda does not seem to spread as easily as Delta. It seems to spread more easily than the previous variants, but it's basically a competition. And right now Delta is winning that competition. So Lambda isn't going to become the next thing, but every single person that is infected has the potential to create the next new variant. So not only are you stopping yourself from getting disease, if you can get vaccinated, you are stopping the development of the variant that is going to be worse than Delta and will be the next one that we really have to worry about. Thank you. Other thoughts, Dr. Steve? Yeah, I agree with uh, Brian about this. And if you look at uh, CDC and the WHO classification of variants, so there's three groups. So uh, the variants of concern are those that are very transmissible, including Alpha, Beta, Gamma, and Delta. So those are the UK, South Africa, and Brazil, and Indian strain. But then this other uh, Epsilon, Theta, and Gamma, they belong to the variants of interest. Meaning to say, uh, they're not as transmissible and also they're more localized. And so, and then the third group is really the one that's resistant to vaccine and treatment and everything. And so far we don't have that kind of uh, variant here. So right now we're just dealing with uh, the predominant strain with variant, which is the Delta, that's really the most transmissible of all that we have faced so far. I was just gonna say viruses want to make more babies. 
They want to make more copies of themselves. So stop giving them a place to make more babies. <laughs> Get vaccinated, <laughs> right? This is what viruses want to do. And if we don't give it a host and a vector for it to replicate, then these changes and mutations won't happen. <laughs> Thank you, doctor. So just thinking about the last, your, your final thoughts for each of you, how, how can we all do our part uh, to fight COVID-19 and keep others safe? I know you said it, shared a lot of ideas, thoughts, but just as one, one statement takeaway or a couple from each of you, could be a resource, could be a website, it could be others about how can they, people get involved? What would be your last uh, thoughts on, on how to, to uh, address the crisis pandemic? Let's talk, start with Dr. Marquez. Sure. Um, you know, we have been directing a lot of effort to Nevada COVID fighter to find information. Uh, call the 800 number, which is 1-800-401-0946 for information and questions. And if, if there's anything I can, I can say um, is really just make sure that the sources of information you're getting are the most reliable. And if, if you're not sure, please call one this number, please check out the website and we'll help you navigate those questions. Uh, Dr. Marquez, would you mind putting that in the, the chat to all? Absolutely. Oh, I, thank you. Dr. Sai, see? Uh, for me, it's uh, a few words like, and this too shall pass. If we all do our role, our play our role very well, like each one, reach one, you know, and realize that we can do it. So this too shall pass. Thank you, Doctor. Other words of advice, Doctor Labus for medicine. Uh, sure. So I, I think in America we love to think of ourselves as individuals, and we have the freedom to do whatever we want. But when it comes to a disease, um, it's not like that, unfortunately. Uh, you can make whatever decisions you want for yourself, but they do affect everybody around you. And you have to think of yourself as not an individual, but a link in a chain. Um, you got the disease from somebody else, you're going to give it to somebody else. And two or three steps down the road, you could kill somebody's grandma because you passed on that disease. And so think of the role you play in the community and what you can do to protect yourself by protecting everybody around you. Thank you. And I just want to tell people that this is not a, it's not a fight. This is, this is not a war between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. We honestly just want everybody to be protected. And so please make sure that you're getting your questions answered. If you are on the fence about getting vaccinated, talk to your doctor, talk to your pharmacist, talk to somebody that you like, know, and trust. And ultimately, um, if you do become positive with COVID-19, don't forget that you can get treatment with monoclonal antibodies. This is another free resource, just like the vaccine that you can get that works best if you get it within seven to 10 days of testing positive. Also, if you've been exposed to somebody who's tested positive, but you are still negative, you can get monoclonal antibodies to prevent yourself from getting COVID-19. So you can go to combat COVID and I'll put it in the chat and you can put in your zip code and you can find out where there's an infusion center close to you and you can get that resource. And again, it is free, just like the vaccination. And um, my last three things that I'll say is mask up, vax up and wash up. <laughs> That's great insight. Thank you so much, doctor and, and the rest of you on the panel. You know, I, I think there's there's also one more website that I was looking at uh, in preparation of this. It's a pretty impressive uh, website. It's the Nevada Minority Health and Equity Coalition website. Some of the um, doctors on this panel have uh, authored some of the resources. There's a few brochures that you can download as well. Uh, very uh, quick reference guides, and there's a contact us uh, tab as well. So I encourage you all to look at that too. I want to thank the panelists today. Very uh, insightful, crisp, clear question, questions and answers. I really appreciate this this uh, this um, background that you're sharing with us today. Um, know that we're broadcasting this as well and recording it uh, for further use. And uh, thank you very much for all the attendees. Uh, have a great rest of your day. Take care. Thank you. <laughs>